Throughout this year, we've been working on the importance of the new covenant. How we live in the new covenant. This morning, we're going to connect the Lord's Supper to the new covenant. Let's begin these thoughts by listening to the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness, for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff. They comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup just overflows. Surely, 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 somebody say surely. Surely, Surely, goodness and mercy follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David describes his covenant with Yahweh. David views his relationship with God as he is the sheep and Yahweh is the shepherd. This is a precious way to view the covenant. The covenant between David and Yahweh is in many ways like the new covenant. That's why this this psalm connects so well to us. It's in many ways the same as the new covenant. Over the last several weeks, we've been looking at the seven blessings. The seven blessings we have in the New Covenant. They connect to this psalm as well. David knows his identity. He's a, he's a sheep. He knows his purpose. Make wool or be lamb chops. He knows his immunity. The sheep are going to be herded. Sheep mistakes are not going to be fatal. He knows he's dwelling in the house of the Lord. The big stick protects him even in the valley of the shadow of the death. He is conformed in the paths of righteousness and he's going to live in the big house forever. The same blessings we have in the covenant are found in Psalm 23. But this morning, what I'm going to to bring out of Psalm 23 is the part about the table. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Eating with the Lord at a table is a symbol of covenant. The the sheep are gathered by the shepherd at at this table in the wilderness. And the enemies are all around. uh, And those who are not in the covenant are watching greedily. And, And the shepherd perhaps picks up the sheep and sits down at the table. And they share this meal together. What an amazing demonstration of covenant. Meals shared have covenant meaning. That's going to be the point of the sermon. Someone asked you later, what was the point of the sermon? The point of the sermon is meals that we share together have covenant meaning. Now watch how this takes place in other places in the Old Testament. If you remember the story of Jacob, and Jacob had an uncle named Laban, very good, and he tricked his uncle Laban and snuck away in the night with his family, and Laban realized he'd been tricked and gets his guys together and is going to go to Knuckle City. But God intervenes and says, no, you make a covenant. Listen to Genesis 31 as Laban makes a covenant with Jacob. 
Come now, let us make a covenant, you and I, and let it be a witness between you and me. So Jacob swore by the fear of his father Isaac, and Jacob offered a sacrifice in the hill country and called his kinsmen to do what? Eat bread. And they ate bread and spent the night in the hill country. They made this covenant and they, con- they brought it together. They accompanied it with a meal. Listen to the Mosaic covenant in Exodus chapter 24. On top of Mount Sinai, or at the base of Mount Sinai, Moses took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And the people said, yes, yes, we'll do it. All that the Lord has spoken we will do and we will be obedient. And Moses took the blood and threw it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Then Moses and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the elders of Israel went up. This is going to be weird. He didn't know this part of the story. They went up and saw the God of Israel. And there was under the God of Israel's feet a pavement of sapphire stone like the very heaven in clearness. And he did not lay down his hand on the chief men or the people of Israel. They beheld God. And what did they do? They had, to, they had the covenant. They offered this Mosaic covenant. They went up and they saw God. And what did they do? They ate and drank in the presence of God. Covenants are confirmed by sharing a meal. Now this same idea carries over into the New Testament. Watch this. Matthew, one of the twelve, deciding he wanted to honor Jesus, does a feast. Listen to what happens in Luke chapter 5. And Levi, or Matthew, made a great feast in his house. And there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at the table with them. And the Pharisees and the scribes did what the Pharisees and the scribes often did, like what I do a lot. They grumbled. They grumbled. Wait a second. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, those who are well don't need the physician, but those who are sick. The Pharisees were upset because their covenant, what they felt like was their covenant with God, was extended to sinners. Wait a second. These guys aren't part of the covenant. We can't eat with them. They're the others. Yikes. Jesus, in this meal, extended the covenant to them. Mills express covenant relationship. Now you remember the lost son, parable of the prodigal son. He goes off, does terrible things. He comes back. What does the father do in Luke chapter 15? But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fat calf and kill it and we're going to eat it. And celebrate. For my son was dead, he's alive again, he was lost, he is found. And they began to celebrate. Now the older son who was out in the field found out what was going on and he was angry and refused to go in. The older son was angry because the the father had renewed the covenant with the lost son, the other guy. Wait a second, he doesn't deserve to share a meal. But the feast welcomed the brother back into the covenant. Ooh. We're getting the point? We're getting the point? These meals have something to do with covenant. Let's look at one more example. On the road to Emmaus, Jesus has been resurrected. He appears to some of his disciples. They don't recognize him until Luke chapter 24, verse 30. When he was at the table, there's a table. You notice there's a table there? There's a table And he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And in that moment when he blessed the bread, their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. 
And they said to one another, did not our hearts burn while he was with us on the road? And he opened up the scriptures. And they rose that same hour, ran all the way back to Jerusalem and said, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. They, they, they were all celebrating. But the point is, at the table, when he broke the bread, their eyes were opened to the presence of their risen Lord. Poof. Meals and covenants. They did the same thing after the church gets cranked up on the day of Pentecost. Listen to these verses. And they devoted, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship to breaking of bread. And day by t- a day, attending the temple and gathering together, they broke breads in their homes and received food with glad and generous heart. On the first day of the week, when they gathered together to break bread, Paul went on to preach. The early church expressed their newly found covenant by breaking bread, by sharing meals together. And there's one meal that I'm looking forward to sharing. Maybe you are too. Revelation chapter 19, there's another meal. Let us rejoice and exalt and give, give him the glory of For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. That's us. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of us. And the angel said, write this down. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper, a meal, of the Lamb. We anxiously look forward to that last meal we're going to share with Jesus. Well, maybe it's the first meal we're going to really share with Jesus. <laughs> that wedding supper of the Lamb. Covenant meals are shared. Within the covenant, what do you do in the covenant? Well, you share meals. Now, with this understanding of the connection between meals and covenant, let's explore the meal where Jesus inaugurated the Lord's Supper, known as the Last Supper, the last meal Jesus would eat with his disciples. It's a precious scene. you got to see this in your mind's eye. It's a precious scene. Jesus and the 12 guys he loves the most are sitting around the table. They've just done a Passover feast. He knows that the next day, that night he's arrested, the next day he's going to be crucified. He knows what's facing his guys. And so he wants to offer this special meal with them. And he chooses two symbols of the new covenant. The first symbol he chose is the loaf of unleavened bread. Luke 22, verses 16 through 19. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this as a symbol, so you will remember me. The sharing of bread is a deeply symbolic act. The sharing of bread calls up all kinds of meanings. Let me focus on three. The bread is a symbol for Christ's actual body, which died on the cross to create a covenant. This is my body. But it's also representative of the community that we call the church. 
We too are called the body of Christ. It is the sharing of a meal within the covenant. But it gets even deeper. It carries with it a meaning of hospitality, of, of community. When we share the bread in just a few moments, it will unite all of us who participate. It unites us. It precludes any racism, any prejudice, any exclusivity, any superiority, any marginalization. Are you hearing me? When you share the body of Christ, you are saying, I am one with all who share in this body of Christ. Now, I'm going to take a little bit of a detour here. Stay with me. This is the point of 1 Corinthians 11. Now, oftentimes, we just pull the verse out of 1 Corinthians 11 that says, do this in remembrance of me, and that's fine. But we're missing the point of 1 Corinthians 11. Listen to the point of 1 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 20. Paul, admonishing the Corinthians, says, when you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper you eat. What? It's supposed to be the Lord's Supper. No, what you're doing is not the Lord's Supper. For in eating, each one of you goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? You don't have houses to eat in and drink in? Or do you despise the body of God? Do you despise the body of Christ? And humiliate, marginalize, have prejudice against those who have nothing? What shall I say? Shall I commend you in this? No way. The rich in Corinth were marginalizing the poor when it came to sharing their communion meal. The very symbol of unity, the very symbol of being the body of Christ, they were using to marginalize those who were poor, those who were slaves, those who couldn't get there in time. The very symbol of unity was being used to exclude. Paul was furious. Let's continue reading in verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body. This is you guys, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup. And after supper, saying, The cup is the new covenant. It's the covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. You proclaim that his death is not exclusive. You proclaim that there is no prejudice in the death of Jesus. You proclaim that nobody is marginalized in the death of Jesus. And you do this until I come again. The death which cuts the covenant, the death which creates his church, cannot be divided. He continues in verse 27. Whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, in a manner in which excludes, marginalizes, and is prejudiced, will be guilty of profaning my body and my blood, because my body and my blood unites. It does not divide. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat the bread and drink the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, without looking around and seeing I am one with all of these who share the communion with me, eats and drinks judgment on himself. So then, my brothers... When you come together to share this meal of covenant, you wait for each other. And if anyone's hungry, you can't wait until everybody gets there, you eat at the house. So then, when you come together, it will not be for judgment. It will not be exclusive. It will not show discrimination. 
The bread is a symbol of the unity of the body of Christ formed by its death. It should never be used to divide. Somebody say amen. Amen. I'm going to have a heart attack. (laughs) The second symbol he chooses, he could have chose others, the second symbol he chose was the wine. Luke 22, 20. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the covenant in my blood. Wine also carries powerful meanings. It looks like blood, sort of. In this blood shed to create a covenant, we remember Jesus' death, which cuts the new covenant. We're thankful for his sacrifice. Maybe an amen there would be good too. We're thankful for the sacrifice of Jesus. His blood brings us into the seven blessings of the covenant. Bam! We're part of the covenant by his love. Now remember, he is saying this in the upper room during a Passover feast. Think Passover. Think angel. Think Passover. Think blood on the, on the doorpost and the lentils. Think protection. Think covering. The Lamb of God is the Lamb of the Passover who was offered to create this covering of protection. We're thankful there is protection in the covenant. Now here's one more connection you didn't know. I guarantee not even Tara knew this. Well, maybe Tara knew it. Not the rest of us. One more connection. Look back in Genesis chapter 14. What? Genesis 14 and Melchizedek. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out, what does it say? Bread and wine. Wait a second, that sounds like the Lord's Supper. He was the priest of the God Most High. And Melchizedek blessed Abram and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High. There's a connection to blessings. The bread and the wine connect to being blessed by God in the covenant and in return offering those blessings back. Bread and wine powerful symbols of the new covenant. All right, that's the sermon. Now let's get down to where we can take something home. Here are some takeaways. Symbols are emotional reminders. Think of the symbols in your life. Think of an American flag. Think of a Bronco. No, think of a cowboy. Think of the symbols that connect to our life. Symbols are powerful reminders. This symbol is a powerful reminder of the death that opened up the covenant for us. When we partake of the Lord's Supper It is to remind us powerfully, emotionally, of his death. But two, we connect to the body in hospitality. Yes, it's this way, but it's also this way. It's a horizontal connection. The bread and the wine we share as siblings in a family of God. Number three, There is no marginalization of anyone. Race, gender, age, poor, rich. As we partake of the Lord's Supper, we repent of prejudice. We repent of our marginalization. We reconnect to each other. I don't like Jared very much. Doesn't matter. He's a sibling. You reconnect to him. 
Sharon says, well, I have to work with that chucklehead every day. We reconnect powerfully when we partake of the Lord's Supper. Number four, we reconnect to our baptism. We studied baptism last week. It is a time of commitment to the covenant. We say, as we partake of the Lord's Supper, I live my best for you. It is a time to reconnect to your commitments. Number five, our second Sunday dogs on the first Sunday with chicken are important. Our Sunday morning snacks, our Wednesday night meals. You know, every time we come together, we eat. Have you all noticed that? It's important. When we sit down and share a meal with each other, we are powerfully committing to a covenant with each other. You want to be at the heart of this congregation? You eat with this congregation. You talk to our congregation. You listen to people talk. You get involved in their life. It is in the sharing of a meal that we connect in covenant. That's powerful. Even in our culture, that's powerful. Our second Sunday dogs are important. Number six, we connect vertically to our blessings and we offer thanksgiving and bless God Most High. And number seven, we remember him until he comes. We look forward to that wedding feast of the Lamb. Wow. I like Jared, but I'm going to like sitting at the table with Jesus. We look forward to the wedding feast of the Lamb. We're going to sing a song. Come share the Lord. Watch the words. Watch what I've said. And then we'll partake of the Lord's Supper.